Hi, you're on Queer Idea. I'm Anthony Leckis, and my guests today are here to talk about a cabaret show called My Other Closet, the Cabaret. Matthew and Russ, welcome to the show. Thanks Thank very you. much. Good to be here. So, a cabaret show, My Other Closet, what's it about? Well, My Other Closet, the Cabaret is um, Russell's true life story about um, his experience of domestic violence within a same sex relationship. So we um, created the show to raise awareness about that issue, um, to dispel the myths surrounding um, domestic violence in general, but certainly within um, the same sex and gender diverse communities, um, and to provide some insight into what that experience is actually like um, through the medium of song and, and a cabaret format. Right. And insight into an experience, it's a very specific experience, a very personal experience, isn't it? Because it's your experience, isn't it, Russ? It's my own. Yeah, it's based on my own. It's my own life and, uh, um, you know, it's a journey. It's a journey that we take people on. Um, um, and, you know, the important thing is that uh, at the end of the show is about a survivor. And, uh, you know, so we do, ta we do take people on a journey, but, you know, the end of it is about survival. Right, yeah. and I'm sort of interested in that because you're performing a show, you've put together this show that's so incredibly sensitive and personal and confronting and brave and courageous and all those things and, and, and you, you're both in an rela intimate relationship as well. Yep. Uh, Matthew, the, you're the director Correct. of the show, Russ, you're the performer of the show. What sort of things happen for you as you're rehearsing this? I think first of all, our lounge room is a giant oh, mess at the moment because right. it's full of props and all our furniture's yeah. gone, and <laughs> so we literally live with the show. It's right. a twenty-four-seven um, thing, uh, and, and I think as we've been working on it, we've had to kind of put measures into place to provide that distance and time when when we go. Okay, we're not allowed to talk about the show for the rest yep. of the evening because yep. um, it's time just to be a couple, and yeah. to, you know, yeah. um, watch some television and just enjoy ourselves. And um, but obviously, sometimes those boundaries bleed. And and I think it's interesting because uh, you know we've ex we've experienced during the preparation of the show that you know there's some little demons that you know come out. Um, thankfully, we're aware enough of those uh, of those demons. Um, and whenever those issues have occurred during this process, um, yeah, we're smart enough to, to be able to sit down and acknowledge that that's what it is and talk our way through that, uh, right. that situation. Interesting. So talking your way through it, and I'm wondering about that because you talked about myths earlier about um, domestic violence and, 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 and we don't talk about domestic violence in the mainstream sector like we should, although that's all becoming a very public conversation, isn't it, since the Royal Commission. But in the queer community, I mean, there, there, there are even sort of more barriers to be able to discuss it. Mm. And you guys are discussing it, not just by putting the show together, but expressing it in a sort of performance. Yeah. What's it like, what's it been like for you guys to be um, sort of ambassadors of this work in the community? I think it's, it's been lovely sometimes, uh, certainly after putting it on in Sydney, we, like every party we went to, we, um, you know, would have someone come up and tell us about their own personal reaction to the play and a lot of times that was their um, story of leaving a relationship that they well, thought somebody to be toxic. somebody else's story or, of leaving or they, a relationship. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, you know, that that was really lovely to be a part of and know that, that, that it had that effect for people. Um, I think then there's, you know, been negatives. I think we, um, we've done promotion around the show and kind of talked about what, you know, the whole story. Um, and then we've found that on anti-marriage equality websites as proof that, you know, same-sex right. relationships are, are somehow, uh, you know, not appropriate or whatever. And you don't let that, you, you just don't let that affect you in any way, shape or form. The right. message is important. People can say what they like. Right. Um, attack us personally, that's fine. We have no issue with that. It, it's more important that we get this message out into our community and say it does exist and there are ways to fix it. Right, so you, I mean you're both on a mission with this. This is pretty important stuff you're talking about. Absolutely. So the, the audience, who, who, who are you expecting to come along to this show? Who is this for? Anyone. Yeah. Absolutely anyone. Um, and our experience has been that, you know, at the end of the show we have a Q&A. So people that have, have got or have had an experience or have, have felt anything during this show, um,
can get up and talk about what the, what that experience is and ask questions and ask for some help or, or ask for some direction. And we provide um, counsellors, we put all sorts of things at the end of the show to, to help people because, you know, once they've made that initial disclosure, there needs to be someone to guide them as to where to go. Right. And when writing the script, we were very deliberate about um, you know, making sure that it was respectful, um, that yeah. it was, it's never presented as a joke. Um, no. There are fun parts to the to the show, and there has to be, or it would just be tor torturous for Thank an audience. Thank goodness is the audience. But, um, <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, it's treated very respectfully, and we had um, quite a number of, even though the last season we did was in the Mardi Gras, um, we were surprised to find about a third of our audience was um, women who were identified as heterosexual. Yep. And um, in kind of our chatting with, with uh, people, they said that um, coming to see a show about domestic violence where it's a you know big, hairy bloke, um, bear guy getting up and telling his story that they um, found that less confronting um, and also thought uh, trusted that that would be done respectfully, um, that it was. Yeah, that will, I don't know exactly. I guess because of the multiple experiences of right. discrimination, that yes. um, that we would approach the issue in a way that would be respectful. The show's always the the show has in my in my mind has always needed to ha um, retain integrity, right? Um, and that's what I try and and put into it. Each and time. and what about the message for? I mean, because the show's about su survivors surviving yep. through it and being brave and and sort of dispelling myths about what I guess a victim of family violence looks like. Yeah. What about for the people who use violence, the perpetrators, if you like? What's the message for them? If there's a message for them? Well, I guess they, the show shows them what the results of their actions are, and hopefully they also. Um, you know, have the ability to connect with the services that you know we talk we talk about. It's you know it, we understand that there are two sides, and that that you know uh, both sides equally need um, to be able to uh, get assistance. Right. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of the rhetoric in. Um in the more progressive parts of the domestic violence space is moving away from even labels like um, you know perpetrator and victim and mm -hmm. realizing yes. that toxic relationships are uh, you know complicated and and really both people are making decisions that are unhealthy for themselves and their mm -hmm. partner mm -hmm. um, and both people deserve uh, you know to to get the right assistance and to be able to change that behavior so that they can make a decisions that are and behave in ways that are m better relationships right well, great. It's, a, it's, a, it's great work, guys. Um, good work. I'm looking forward to seeing the show. So all the best with the Cabaret Show. Thank if you. If you want to check out uh, more information on the Cabaret Show, it's My Other Closet, the Cabaret. Check out the website. And you've been watching Queer Idea. Hi everyone and welcome to the talk on Vent TV. I'm Matthew. Uh, we're here we're talking about I guess issues that affect young LGBTI people and we're giving people the talk that I guess they wouldn't have gotten when they were younger. You know a lot of straight people get have the talk by their parents where they explain to them about the birds and the bees but for queer people that's obviously in a lot of the cases missing so we're just here to chat about issues affecting young queer people and today I'm joined by my lovely panelists uh, Jasmine. Michael and Chrissy. Hi everyone. Hello. <laughs> uh, today we thought we'd talk about biphobia in the community because it's quite a prevalent issue but it's also one that I think is largely invisible because for a lot of people that sexuality just is you know often derided or even dismissed um, so I think it's quite an important issue. Uh, to start off with though I was curious to hear from either Chrissy or Jasmine particularly with queer women you know what's bisexuality like in that community like is there a lot of biphobia among queer women in particular or have you experienced that yourself? I think as women, if you identify as bisexual, it's seen either that you've had bad experiences with men in the past that have made you, as a result, turn to women, um, or that you've just yet to find a good man. So you're not really bisexual, you're just out of luck, I guess. That's been my experience anyway. Has it been similar for you, Jasmine? Or? In my experience, um, 
I have read and met a few lesbians who would rather not date bisexual women, I think because um, they feel like, oh, I'm just an experiment, they'll just go back to men eventually, and it also um, conjures up these feelings of competition with men that lesbians would want to avoid. Oh, in the sense um, that men would be like, well, if you're bisexual, like, you just, you know, I, I'm going to get you because, like, I want you to be with a man. Is that what you mean? Um, More so between the, the woman between and women. the two women. Oh, Feeling right. competition between the bisexual and the Because she can't desired. compete with a man. Yeah. 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 Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, oh. there's competition between the lesbian and then men who yeah. also like mm -hmm. women. And do you think there's also, like, I guess, uh, an erasure of that sexuality in some cases? Like, do you think there are some queer people who almost think... Like, you're not really bisexual, you must just be on the pathway to being a lesbian or even, I mean, straight, but just, you know, th th that it's almost like a liminal sexuality that a lot of people tend to discredit? Definitely. I think there's a lot of um, erasure. And I think it, a lot of people who have come out as gay, lesbian, et cetera, um, have often come out as bisexual first. Um, it's kind of a stepping stone to, I don't know, the next phase, if you will. Yeah, of course. Um, so I think a lot of people will look back on their experiences like, oh yeah, well I came out as bisexual, you know, but I actually I'm gay or whatever. And then what apply it think? to like all bi people. Yeah. You know, even though it's not the case. And that's the thing, yeah. I know there are plenty of people back in my hometown who, I don't want to say plenty, maybe like two or three, but that <laughs> had that similar experience where, you know, they said that they were bisexual and then ultimately ended up coming out as gay. Um, and that was obviously very a very valid and journey or experience for them. But I think when people see that, it almost, it's easy to, yeah, apply that to across the board and think, oh, that's just what everyone does, you know, they just go through that period. I mean, for gay men, like, I mean, what's your experience been like, Michael? Well, I did that. I did the whole bi thing for, like, I, I, wasn't, I was never bisexual, but I identified as bi for a couple of weeks mm -hmm. and then came out as gay. But it was kind of... But can I just ask, when you did that, did you know during those weeks that you actually weren't bi? Or did you think you would bi? Pretty much. Um, yeah, like I wasn't ready to come out okay. as gay, but mm -hmm. I knew that I was definitely attracted to men. Mm -hmm. And maybe I was questioning women, like mm -hmm. praying that I was still attracted to women mm -hmm. because I wanted that access to that heterosexual, well, heterosexual life. Because, yeah. you know, when I knew coming out to my parents, even though my parents weren't religious, I, they would see me as like, well, you've now lost access to this happy life of marriage and family, marriage to a woman and you know, having kids the natural way and all of that. And so I thought if I'm bisexual, I still have my attraction to men, but I also have access to this life. Even though, of course, bisexual people are still, you know, if they're read as heterosexual, that's still a rage of their identity, but they yeah. still have access to it. That's what I was yeah. gonna actually bring up, that kind of interesting dual identity. Like for people that obviously are legitimate, legitimately bisexual, there's that instant, that's the kind of like, you're in between in a sense because we're well, more ways than one, but, you know, in the queer community you may feel othered because you're not completely entirely, you know, you may be read as straight in many instances. And with the straight community, you almost have, in some instances, a privilege of passing as straight. So you're not necessarily met with as much overt, you know, homophobia as people in the queer community might be. Or there might be people that read as overtly queer. Mm -hmm. um, so for people that are bisexual, I mean, how important is it for their visibility, for their identities to be visible and to be acknowledged and accepted, not just by straight people, but actually by people in our community mm -hmm. as well? I mean, how important do you think that is? Well, when I, I thought I was bisexual for a very mm. long time. I think I identify as bisexual from about the age of, probably not out to anyone else, but to myself, probably from about 15, 14, um, until <laughs> like last year. Oh, recently, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh my goodness. And then yeah. I realized, oh, actually, no. <laughs> um, but I know that during that whole time, that was a huge part mm -hmm. of just not feeling embraced by the queer community, especially because at the time, I was dating um, a cisgendered male, so I was constantly being read as um, heterosexual, and that was like very upsetting for Can me. Can you think of any ex examples during that time where someone, either in your life or outside of your life, that you told you were bisexual, uh, said something negative or uneducated, or just they dismissed oh, it in some way? Definitely. Like yeah. I remember being told that until you've actually dated women, how you're not, like, are you really a bisexual because you haven't had that experience? So, yeah. And Michael and Jasmine, I mean, have you even encountered it yourself or even just witnessed it in the community, like with friends or people that you know that are bisexual? Yeah, definitely. I think um, a lot of women are seen as, a lot of bisexual women are just seen as heterosexual because we kind of look at, we kind of hypersexualize bisexual women or like we sexualize, mm -hmm. you know, two women like being sexual together as like, you know, for the heterosexual male gaze and all of that. So it's seen as experimenting where like, 
a man like looks at another penis and is gay, you know. Yeah. So, um, and I think it's like really important for bisexual people to like have that representation and. Because it's always just yeah. seen as like an experiment on television or something. And bisexual people actually have, there have been a lot of studies that, have, that show that they've actually got worse mental illness, like suffer from, like greater numbers suffer from depression and suicide attempts than actual like gay and lesbian people. Well, interestingly, mm. year after year um, at Pride March here in Melbourne, when the Bisexual Alliance or a March in the March, like un, uh, un, every year um, they're met with people that shout out things at them because they just discredit their identities, like specifically that group. I'm sure other groups experience it mm -hmm. as well, but interestingly, that group does as well so as much as it's invisible and dismissed in many cases people who do acknowledge it a lot of the times have negative negativity around it because they just obviously think you know similar to what you've all been speaking about you know it's not it's not legitimate or you know you're not really bisexually you're clearly just in some you know middle phase where you haven't quite moved all the way over to queer um so i think it's it's really problematic but um, I think we're out of time. So thank you so much for uh, joining me again, guys. And uh, thank you for joining us here on, at the talk on Bent TV. Good evening. Welcome to Bent TV. My name is Steve Pereira. We're visiting with Helena Nestroy, who is a sex coach. We all know that every man and every woman's secret desire is really to become the best lover in the world. And what Helena does is help us do that. So here we are in suburban Baldwin with Helena Nestroy. Welcome, Helena. Thank you. So what is it that you actually do as a sex coach? I help people have great sex. I specialize in ancient tantric practices and rituals that redefine really what it means to have great sex, what it means to create mutually nurturing and deeply satisfying uh, sex. So I teach my clients these beautiful tools and rituals of tantric lovemaking. I help them to create a much deeper connection, a much stronger bond with their partner. I, I help them create this, this, this beautiful um, profound pleasure um, lasting passion in their relationships because there is a lot of suppression around sexuality in our society and I believe that we're all entitled to amazing, orgasmic, mind-blowing sex. So this is exactly, exactly what I do. I show my clients how to embrace their sexuality for the most amazing, mind-blowing, passionate experiences of their lives. Now you use sex and sex therapy not in so as, as a holistic, so it's about being better generally as a person and connecting more with people generally, because that's the heart of what Tantra is about, is about how you connect with other people. Exactly. So, so even though you, you, you focus on the sex, it's, it's about a more larger relationship building. Oh, exactly. Yeah. You cannot just concentrate on physical practices mm -hmm. and physical, I guess, techniques mm -hmm. in order to improve your sex life. It just doesn't work. This is why all these magazines out there promote five great ways to, um, I don't know, give your partner a better, better oral sex or seven new ways to do this or that in bed, but it just doesn't work. It doesn't change anything. We have to introduce our hearts, our minds, our, our souls into our lovemaking. We need to really turn sex into a very holistic experience. Yeah. There is no quick fix. There is, it, it's, it's a bit of a process of changing the body, of embracing sexuality on that very deep cellular level where we can use our breath to spread sexual energy through the whole body in order to experience these expanded, orgasmic, deeply nurturing experiences. So then we, that, then we can give that to our partners as well, which then creates deep union, profound, intimacy and that deep orgasmic ecstatic bliss together so how did you get into this field what inspired you to be, to take this really alternative route into career yeah my i guess my personal motivation is really my my own my life story what mm. happened to me personally because um where i grew up i grew up in poland 
in a very devoted Catholic family where there was no talk, no conversation about sex. There was no proper sexual education. The only sex education I ever received was just this biological approach to our reproductive system. So I never learned anything about consent or boundaries or listening to my own body too in order to embody that pleasure, embody that, that sensual aspect of myself. So this created a very dysfunctional um, relationship, relationship to my own body, to my genitals, where I actually perceived my genitals as dirty or sinful or shameful and nothing to really enjoy. So that basically means that I, I was using my body in order to give sex to my partners. I believe that my body belongs to them. So whenever they wanted to have sex, I had to give it to them, regardless of how I felt about it, how my body felt about the sexual experience. And so I experienced a lot of pain and discomfort, a lot of abuse um, in that sexual area of my life. And so that finally pushed my body beyond its limits and I ended up in the hospital. Really? Yeah. So that was a huge crisis in my life. I was that... Um, trip I took to the hospital to the emergency room was so scary I I was in more, more pain than I could have ever you know imagined I was completely paralyzed by pain and I, I I really thought that I would either die or never be able to have sex again fortunately I was able to come back home the same day and I was actually fine but this was such a scary experience for me I knew that things had to change I knew that how old were you when this happened what happened was my partner's um, penis hit a muscle inside of my, my vagina. Muscle, it was a, somewhere around my bladder. So that muscle, muscle went into spasm. And it was so strong that my whole vaginal area was just paralyzed with pain. Oh, right, okay. It was a, yeah, it was a <laughs> very scary experience. How old were you when this happened? That was about three years ago. Oh, that was a lot. Okay. Yeah, yeah. so that, that actually yeah. launched me into my tantric... Yep. Um, practice. Quest, yeah, in my tantric, tantric pra practice. So on the way back from the hospital, I knew that things have to change mm -hmm. and that I needed to re-educate myself around sexuality. I needed to find new ways and new approach to sex. Because Can I just ask if you were practicing Catholic at that point? Yes. You are? So oh, no, no, sorry. Practicing Catholic as you... Practicing Catholic, no, no. <laughs> you want to practice Catholic? No, no, I quit Catholic Church a long time ago, but I was brought up Catholic. Right. And that's where a lot of that suppression and shame and guilt around my sexuality came from. That's right. So, no. But I left church probably around 10 years ago, so... So, yeah. so can you be Catholic and have good sex? I believe so. How is that possible? Because as Catholics, we're told that sex is just for procreation. It's not something to be enjoyed. That anything to do with sexuality and our genitals is bad. Yeah. You know, we, can, we shouldn't even touch the genitals. That's, that's... Yeah, that's, that's true. But I do believe that we can... Um, follow the beautiful principles of Catholic religion and be kind and loving and considerate but at the same time we can also embrace that sexual aspect of ourselves because biologically we are all sexual beings God created us with genitals with skin that is beautifully sensitive to touch so we are capable of experiencing a lot of pleasure and we shouldn't be denying that aspect of ourselves thinking that there's something wrong with it yep it's a beautiful aspect of it's a, the most wonderful, beautiful way to exp express romantic love between partners. So we should embrace that as sacred and beautiful. It's a lovely thought. We'd all love to do that. But just to come back to your story. So once you, um, you had your, your trauma, so how did you study to become a sex coach or, or, or tantric sex? And, and you were in Poland at the time? No, I was already here. I was in Australia. Yep. And... Um, so I started researching sexuality and I had heard that word Tantra before, so yeah. I thought maybe maybe it's just something there. Yeah. I, I started studying Tantra, I started reading about Tantra, I started attending different Tantric workshops and and I knew that I found something special. I just I just knew it. And so I took my first practitioner training through the Australian School of Tantra, in, which is based in Barron Bay. But the problem about Tantra is that there, is, there isn't one Tantra university where you can go and obtain all of your diploma degrees. I basically had to search and connect with teachers all over the world, with any, anybody who is a great authority or who has got a lot of experience in the world of Tantra. 
Thank you. You've been watching Steve Pereira on Ben TV in Suburban Baldwin, where we've been talking sex with the fabulous Helena Nestroy.